Welcome back, everyone, to day two of Inspire. I hope you were all able to attend yesterday. If not, those recordings and materials will be available on our event hub site. And that is the case for today's and all of Inspire sessions as well. So my name is Terry Martin with Mapstick Foundation. I, along with my colleagues, Charlotte Abel, Jared Doak, and Trisha Lawson will be facilitating this session, monitoring for any questions you post and sharing your comments from the chat. So thank you for joining us for the session, Drones, taking stock of a national capability. A lot is happening in this space of drones and imagery, particularly for disasters and humanitarian aid. And the speakers we have today have some exciting initiatives and advances to share with you. So thank you, Chris Todd, Charles Warner, and Austin Worcester for joining us today. Um, for those of you who are specifically into drones or imagery or follow the NAPSIG Prep Tech Talk series, you may recognize our three guests. Well, a lot has happened since we hosted that event in July, including collaborations during disasters on UAS imagery. So we are thrilled to have them back to report on those efforts. So this is our agenda for today. Mr. Todd will be providing an update on UAS for disasters and getting us up to speed with the current lay of the land. Mr. Werner will be sharing with us additional context on UAS adoption, as well as share a new collaborative initiative between drone responders, ART, and their partners to address challenges experienced during recent disasters. And finally, Mr. Worcester will be briefing not only on considerations for deployed UAS assets, but also share some really innovative collaborations they have embarked on during um, to turn imagery into actionable information products for decision makers. So I hope I didn't steal anybody's thunder too much there. Um, before we get started, I know our speakers appreciate and our attendees are generally interested to know how far other organizations are on this topic. So if you will please complete this one question poll, we'll leave it up here for a minute or until answers stop coming in. But if you could just share with us, which of the following statements best describe how drones and imagery from drones are presently positioned within your agency or organization. So we're interested to see where you are. Um, no judging here is totally anonymous, but it would be helpful for us to know, um, you know where you all are so that our speakers can kind of speak to that and spend more time in different areas based on that feedback. So people are still entering. We'll let it keep going for a little bit longer. Okay, I'll leave it up to you, Charlotte. There we go. All right, so everyone can see the results. Um, it looks like about 40% are not currently operating drones or using drone imagery. Um, about the same amount, a little bit less are using the imagery and same for um, not operating drones or use, but do use imagery. So. That's pretty interesting, and I think our speakers will be able to speak to why this is um, the, the results that we're seeing. So thank you very much for launching that poll, and thank you guys for um, participating, and I really appreciate that. So um, I would like to get us started with our first speaker. Christopher Todd is the Executive Director of the Airborne International Response Team. He is a Certified Emergency Manager and an FAA Part 107 Remote Pilot who has flown a wide assortment of disaster response missions with small UAS. Mr. Todd also serves as a command staff member of the Florida Region 7 All Hazards Incident Management Team based out of the Palm Beach County Fire Rescue Department. So thank you, Chris, for being with us. I will turn it over to you if you are able to take over and share your screen for us. I sure will. Are you able to hear me okay? I can hear you. Okay, looks like I can't activate video. My, my camera, just to give you a heads up, it says host has stopped video and now How we're about starting. Now? Hey, that works. Good morning. I have the power. Thank you. And if you're able to share screen, I will turn over controls to you. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and here we go. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. And I have to tell you, those survey results are actually pretty much what we expected. Uh, pretty, pretty evenly divided, about a third um, not using drones, not using imagery, about a third um, using the imagery but not flying the drones, and then a third uh, flying drones and using the imagery. So no matter where you are or what your needs are, uh, I think you'll get something out of these 
presentations today. So I'm really excited to be here and, and thank you again for, uh, for having us. I know Inspire has been a, just a, a great supporter of what we're doing in, in NAPSIG Foundation. So we really love working with, with these guys and all of you. So let's get right into it. Um, again, uh, my background, I'm a certified emergency manager. I'm also a Florida professional emergency manager. I am an FAA certified part 107 remote pilot, which means I am authorized to conduct commercial operations with drones. I serve on the Florida Region 7 command staff for the All Hazards Incident Management Team, and I'm the executive director of the Airborne International Response Team. We're a 501c3 organization based in Miami. We're also uh, the official home of drone responders, which you'll be hearing more about uh, when Chief Werner speaks a little bit later. Also founder and president of Airborne Response, a force services uh, drone service provider. So my background covers emergency management. It covers um, aviation and it, it fills in the gaps in technology. And that's kind of the perspective I bring to the table. So what I wanna talk about today is, is real briefly just about AIRT and the work we do. Uh, we're gonna get into a primer on small unmanned aircraft systems, especially for those of you who are either not familiar or not using the systems, just so you can have a basic understanding. We'll talk about some of the current limitations and some of the pitfalls of drones. Uh, then we'll look at the, it from an emergency management perspective. What are some of the benefits for incident management? How is it impacting EM? Um, some of the big questions and keys if you're looking at maybe starting a UAS program, and then what you need to know about training remote pilots, coordinating the assets, and then 10 key takeaways for you to hopefully take away from the presentation back into your job. And preparedness. This is just a, a photo of us working with some of the USAR teams here in South Florida at a training exercise at Florida International University in Miami. We recommend training, training, exercising, and more training. Uh, these systems are new. It takes a lot of coordination to really get it right. And it's, it's not as easy as some people make it look. So it, it takes a little bit of work. So I want you to imagine for a second, a, a massive earthquake strikes a major US city. It lasts for longer than one minute. There's mass devastation, fires burning for three days, over 200,000 people homeless. This would be a pretty massive incident. I think we would all agree. And it actually happened. It happened back April 18th, 1906. Uh, the San Francisco earthquake. And there was a commercial photographer from Chicago named George Lawrence, who is known for experimenting with um, hot air balloons and kites and putting customized camera systems on these uh, kites. And after the big earthquake, he loaded his team and his equipment up on a train. They made the trek out to San Francisco and they launched uh, one of his systems called the Captive Airship. It was a balloon kite tethered system. They put it up at various locations around San Francisco. And these are the types of photos they started gathering. And, and nobody had ever seen imagery like this before from a major disaster. I mean, these photos are now in the Library of Congress. And it was really after these photos started running in newspapers, uh, even around the world, that people started realizing how massive the devastation was in San Francisco, and that's when the aid really started flowing. So it kind of marked the first time that aerial imagery was used to start mapping out a disaster, or at least provide some perspective on how bad things, things were. So fast forward now, and we have these small unmanned aircraft systems or drones. And this is an example of Hurricane Michael back in October 2018, uh, of us putting up a small drone to get that same type of look. And you can see the damage to the buildings, damage to homes in the nearby neighborhood. You can see people queuing up to get uh, food and water distribution and, uh, and some of the supplies coming in on the flatbed truck. So it, it, when you look at this, it, you see a bunch of different stories happening. And that is the power of aerial imagery, whether it's from aircraft, from drones, from satellites, it helps tell the story. And then obviously when you put this into the GIS environment, uh, the story can be magnified and amplified. This is an, an example of, of a small drone. This is a DJI Inspire 2, pretty basic cinematography drone. We'll use this for damage assessment, uh, powerful, fast, uh, and very re re reliable. So about AIRT, we were founded in June 2017 as a Florida nonprofit based in Miami Beach. And we're, we, again, we're the official home of drone responders. And one of the, uh, the partnerships, so we work with various organizations, but we are really excited today because we're announcing a new partnership uh, with Esri. We're coming on board as an Esri partner to conduct uh, various testing of their systems such as drone to map and site scan. And we'll be evaluating how to, uh, to take that imagery and, and what the right workflow is to put it into ArcGIS and ArcGIS Online and other Esri products and tools. Uh, also, we've got a special project that Chief Warner is gonna tell you about coming up 
uh, in, in the next segment with ESRI, but we're really happy to have them aboard and we really thank them for their support of this conference as well. So the mission for AIRT is to provide innovative unmanned aviation capabilities to help people prepare for, respond to, and recover from expanding incidents, complex emergencies, and major disasters. Uh, we conduct research, we analyze, we educate ed end users on how to use drones for good. Uh, we support the adoption and use of unmanned aircraft systems by public safety and emergency services organizations around the world. And we work with top tier partners to produce content and training uh, such as AUVSI, Commercial UAV Expo. Um, there's a whole list I could go through. But this again is a, another example of Hurricane Michael. And this is one of our pilots in the field, just completed the damage assessment operation uh, I think this was the flea market in Panama City. And you can see the damage from the ground, but the aerial image obviously tells a whole different story. And that's why we use drones. So the vision statement for, for AIRT simply is we're looking to become the world's leading nonprofit or organization uniting key stakeholders across government, industry, academia, NGOs, and volunteer contributors for the purpose of deploying drones for good. And that's really what we're all about. So preparedness, uh, again, training is everything. Another example of how we train at Florida International University, working with their Academy for International Disaster Preparedness to teach students how to take the imagery from drones and develop data products. And this is just one of the first steps in the field of how we work with them. So significant deployments for AIRT, um, been on a variety of exercises. We've worked in foreign countries, Dominican Republic, Colombia. Um, hurricanes, disaster exercises, FIU bridge collapse. So we've had a, a, a good amount of, of real life deployments to go out and test and evaluate and, and really decipher what works and what doesn't work. And again, we're always learning. The learning never really stops. Uh, this was an example of an exercise at the Port of Miami where we were working with Miami-Dade Fire Rescue and the US Army uh, for a hazmat exercise for a weapon of mass destruction. So. Uh, the key takeaway from this exercise is the fire chiefs in the command center said because they had the drone imagery coming in, um, they had never heard the radio chatter so quiet. I mean, because they could see situational awareness from the drones, there was no need to use the radios and, and it was just eerily quiet compared to what they were used to. So again, another key takeaway. So let's talk about uh, UAS and drones. So you, you hear these different terminologies. UAS uh, really means unmanned aircraft system for the FAA. Sometimes you'll hear it referred to as an unmanned aerial system. Uh, SUAS is a small unmanned aircraft system that refers to an aircraft that is less than 55 pounds in total weight with a payload. A drone kind of got the name from a droning noise, which what the traditional engines sound like. Um, a slang, but commonly used term for UAS. And UAV, uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, um, typically what the military might use, larger vehicles, but you'll hear all of these terms used interchangeably, so just be aware of that. As far as types of UAS, uh, fixed wing, rotary wing, vertical takeoff and landing, there's aerostats uh, out there that uh, with lift gas such as hydrogen or helium. So it's really expanding and the different types of vehicles are, are you know, every month there's a new one coming out. So just be aware that these terms can be used a little bit liberally. So what is the value proposition of these systems? And, and very simply, it's that public safety organizations historically uh, have not had direct access to traditional manned aviation capabilities. You see the Firehawk there for LA County Fire. Um, just an example, less than 1% of public safety agencies could really call on these resources. Aviation programs are expensive. Uh, they're, they're complex and it's not something that a small town fire department or police agency might be able to, to utilize. So when we look at that from an incident management perspective, uh, historically, we had satellites at high altitudes, uh, specialized fixed wing aircraft at high altitude, but manned aircraft, lower altitudes, rotary in fixed wing aircraft, helicopters, small planes. And those were really used from type one to what we call type four incidents. So from the national state level, down to maybe the county or fire district level, maybe some large cities. For smaller municipalities, uh, villages, townships, um, small cities, there was an, what we call an air gap. There was really no aviation resource capable for these small agencies to use to get situational awareness of what was happening from the air. They were forced to use ground-based perspectives and ground-based imagery. So what unmanned aircraft systems do now is they fill that gap across the board. So from a type one, to a type five incident, the smaller incident, um, everyone will now have drones, small drones that they can put up 
And whether it's a small structure fire, a traffic accident, a tornado, uh, they will easily have a way that they can, can get eyes up and, and get an, an aerial perspective on what that incident looks like. And that is the real value proposition of what these systems are delivering right now. So it's shifting operational paradigms, right? So we're looking at hurricanes. Uh, 2017 was really a benchmark year with Harvey, with Irma, with Maria. Uh, we, we saw how drones could um, not only work with flood events, but wind events and, and mass damage. Uh, we saw wildfires, tornadoes, public safety. Uh, also public information and news gathering is another area that has been dramatically affected um, through drones. I mean, it's hard to watch a newscast now and uh, especially at the national level and not see aerial shots coming in from drones because it's just so easy and cost effective for them to do. So example missions for drones, uh, how bad is bad? Um, you know, people don't believe it till they see it. So we wanna get the eyes up, get eyes on and, and really tell them what's going on. Um, search and rescue, rapid aerial damage assessment, uh, condition assessment for critical infrastructure, uh, insurance claims, including FEMA claims, debris management, beach erosion, uh, these use cases keep growing. Here's an example of us, uh, power restoration after Hurricane Irma working at night, power crews and, and public safety crews on scene. Um, here is debris management taking place in Miami-Dade County. All that debris that is blown down by the storm has to go somewhere and using drones to not only assess how big the piles are, but value metric calculations can be really beneficial. And looking at things like beach erosion. Uh, this was a project in Miami Beach that the Army Corps of Engineers had renourished the beach and the hurricanes came through and we went up to see uh, how much was taken away. And of course, um, search and rescue uh, damage assessment. This was Hurricane Dorian in Marsh Harbor, the Bahamas. And just from a, 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 a still photograph, you can see how bad the damage is. But we also did some testing and this is using a product called PIX4D React, which is rapid uh, mapping and stitching the photos together in the field. And we're able to generate these orthomosaic uh, uh, stitched uh, imagery to then give to the, the search and rescue teams or the GIS specialists to plug into the map. They can overlay and really see what the damage is looking like. So that's, again, that's the power of these systems. The limitations of the systems, um, quite frankly, that there are a few. Um, operating drones today is kind of like using AOL back in 1996. We operate in a radio controlled line of sight, uh, visual line of sight requirement in the FAA, which means that um, you, know, you, you can't fly super long distances. So you're kind of uh, confined to a certain area, but it's, uh, you know, that's changing. New regulations are coming out, new technology is coming. And I think in the next couple of years, we're going to see that, uh, that evolve dramatically. But because it's line of sight, here's an example of us uh, working in a neighborhood for damage assessment. We basically have ground crews walking along with the drones to keep them out of the trees, uh, electrical wires, any kind of obstacles. So it's, uh, it's a learning curve and we're figuring out the workflows, but it's, uh, it's what we do today is going to evolve dramatically over the next five to 10 years. So other factors, um, FA part 107 for its commercial operation, that's kind of the starting point for most drone operations, um, standardized training and certification for public safety. Uh, we've got to establish a culture of aviation safety. Um, aviation programs traditionally are all about safety and operational effectiveness. Um, and at, at the ground level, they've got safety, but not aviation safety. So we're having to blend the two. And, uh, and so when ground, forces, firefighters, police officers start using drones. We need to bring in that culture of aviation safety to the organization. Uh, trust level between remote pilots and manned aircraft pilots. Uh, if you're the guy flying the helicopter or a guy in an airplane, you're not really sure how much experience a guy on the ground flying the drone might have or a girl down there. So, uh, you know, the, it's building trust is, is really paramount. We've got cyber concern, uh, security concerns, geopolitical sensitivities, if you heard of the Blue UAS initiative at the federal level, and of course, Moore's law. I mean, the, the technology is increasing so rapidly that we're seeing a lot of agencies make investments and within a couple of years, those investments might be outdated, unlike a helicopter you purchase and you might use for 10, 20, 25 years. So uh, all considerations that impact how these programs evolve. Uh, we've conducted some research with air and drone responders to public safety agencies. Um, most programs have less than 10 total pilots. For, so those of you out there who don't have drones or aren't using drones, um, you're not alone. Um, and, and most programs are not that big right now. And also the number of missions most agencies are flying is, is not huge. It's maybe 10 missions max per month. Uh, also, most of the agencies are purchasing this equipment through grants 
over 90% of public safety agencies rely on some form of grant funding to fund their program. And we're seeing annual budgets of less than $10,000 per year. So that's not a lot of money uh, to really get the equipment, to have a staff. We're seeing a lot of public safety folks with collateral duty. And I know Chief Warner is gonna talk about that a little bit more. So uh, just be aware that it's, these programs are in the infancy, and, but they are growing. And that's what we really like to see. So um, the good news is 92% of state and local governments say that drones are gonna have a significant impact on their agendas. And that comes from a survey from the, uh, the Center for Digital Government. And here's an example of Miami Beach Police, an exercise but using drones to help guide the SWAT team, form the stack, and, and then uh, conduct a breach at a nightclub, uh, again, for a simulation. So these programs are, are growing. All the data we're seeing is number of remote pilots, emissions per month are increasing, mission types are expanding, program tenure is increasing, and drones are becoming the next big thing. So the benefits for incident management are uh, local aviation resources for all jurisdictions. Their drones are easy to deploy, they're easy to transport, they're cost efficient. You can use a variety of payload sensors for assorted mission types and rapid turnaround of imagery and data. They're also environmentally friendly, right? Most are electric. So we're looking at smart energy, clean energy, and in the current landscape, they are COVID-19 social distancing compliant, which is another win. Here's an example of the FIU pedestrian bridge collapse back in uh, 2018. We conducted a variety of missions here, mapping uh, situational awareness, public information. So the impacts on emergency management, we're seeing training and exercises becoming uh, really impacted, tabletop preparedness, response scenarios, live drills with hazmat um, units, and, and hazmat is really discovering some new ways to, to use these systems, as well as full-scale exercises and multi-stakeholder coordination. Uh, we're seeing the drones impact plan predicted incidents, special events and hurricanes, anything that you can plan for not only mitigation, but immediate response after the incident. Um, great tools for that, as well as unplanned incidents such as tornadoes and earthquakes, where the drones allow you swift mobilization of resources uh, to help provide a rapid response. Uh, they're providing aerial situational awareness, which is now within reach of emergency managers at almost every level, again, for any type of incident, type five through type one. Um, FEMA does have UAS resource typing, uh, two entries. One is unmanned aircraft systems team. The other is a technical specialist for unmanned aircraft systems. So uh, if you need to call on resources, those should be in IRIS or the FEMA database where you're looking for resources from. And we're also gonna be helping to build that database and Chief Warner is gonna talk a little bit about that again coming up. Uh, emergency drone services contracts, uh, kind of like dump trucks, right? Would you buy a bunch of dump trucks if you need them after a hurricane or would you lease them? Same thing with drones. It's great to have service contracts in place with vendors who can come in and provide assistance. And again, drones awesome for aerial rapid damage assessment, uh, especially when, when manned aircraft might not be in the immediate vicinity after uh, an immediate event. Um, some other impacts, uh, airspace authorization and waivers. How do you get authorization to operate in airspace where manned aircraft might be conducting search and rescue operations? They've got to coordinate with the FAA, air traffic control, special operations security group, and make sure you have the proper authorization. And then looking at the future, how it's gonna impact EM, uh, 5G networks and the rapid communication that those are gonna offer are gonna really allow for the faster transfer of data and imagery uh, to where it needs to go. Um, data storaging and archiving, who's responsible for it, what's gonna be archived, where, when, and how, what can't you use, what information is personally identifiable information. Um, those are issues we're working through right now as well, as well as concerns surrounding privacy, cybersecurity, um, and it's really forcing emergency managers to start to kind of reevaluate the traditional role and structure of the air operations branch in the incident command system. So, it, the, you know, there's questions that are drones an aviation resource or is it a tool that a ground use our team might use? And the truth is, it's probably both. So where does it fit in? How does it fit in? Uh, these are all issues that are being wrestled with. And looking ahead, um, the day will be coming when these systems are transporting cargo, when we're using drone swarms to conduct rapid damage assessment and things like that. So it's going to be really exciting to look ahead and, and see where, where this has taken us. So big questions. Um, do you want to own drones? Do you want to rent drones? Uh, and what we see a lot of agencies do is they'll maybe hire some consultants to come in or some contractors to provide services, as well as have disaster services on hand. But eventually, they want to own the systems and use them on their own. Uh, another question, who's foot footing the bill? 
what size budget do you need? And where's that money coming from? Do you have an experienced grant writer who can help you get grant funding? So uh, that's another question that a lot of uh, program managers are struggling with. And what is the end game? And what we like to tell people is make sure you include your GIS teams and data end users of the aerial products in the discussion up front. We're seeing too often that agencies are going out and buying drones and maybe it can't do uh, what it needs to do for the person who actually wants to look at the data at the end of the day. So make sure you're looking at a holistic chain of workflow chain um, to make sure that you're getting the right systems to get you the right data. Because at the end of the day, it's really a math equation. The desired output is gonna determine the rest of the formula, including the equipment that you purchase. So starting a UAS program, couple tips, uh, find a champion, engage the community. Too many public safety agencies go out and they start building the program without any community input. And especially in places like New York and Los Angeles, there's a lot of pushback from privacy groups and other groups that are um, a little concerned about that. So we really recommend that you work uh, with the various community stakeholders up front to let them know uh, what your intentions are, be as transparent as possible. Also demonstrate the technology to news media and local schools. The same way the canine teams, canine teams will go out to local schools, do that with your drone team. It's a great way to get buy-in from the local community and, and from the kids. Uh, establish realistic goals and a realistic timeline for success. Maybe you want to do a pilot test uh, before you actually go full blown with the program just to help build community conference, uh, confidence and learn from other agencies using drones. There's no need to re reinvent the wheel. Uh, DroneResponders.org is a great source of information where we've got all different uh, standard operating procedures, news information on, on how these systems have been used for a wide, wide array of missions. So I encourage you to go visit DroneResponders.org to, to seek that information. So training remote pilots, a um, couple tips here, select personnel who have a passion for technology and or aviation. If you're voluntolding somebody to do it, you may not be setting yourself up for long-term success. Again, FAA Part 107 is really a starting point. If you're gonna have pilots, make sure they're Part 107 certified. Create a culture of aviation safety and risk management and train your pilots and build your program based on ASTM small unmanned aircraft system standards with compliance validation by drone responders. And we can come out and, and help you and give you more information on that. Again, we conduct a wide variety of events. Uh, coming up next month, we'll be at AUVSI's Exponential Virtual Edition. So if you want more information on drones and these systems, I, I encourage you to check out Exponential, AUVSI Exponential, and the Drone Responders uh, Global Public Safety Summit that we'll be hosting. Uh, coordinating UAS assets, um, establish contact with nearby jurisdictions, discuss mutual assistance agreements. Uh, sometimes you want to accept unglamorous missions to prove the ROI. Believe it or not, most missions right now are public information. That's where a lot of value comes out. And uh, again, the Incident Resource Inventory System, IRIS, with FEMA, will be um, typing um, drone programs from around the world through the Drone Responders Program, and in and, and the U.S. will be... Uh, putting those who want to participate in the IRIS system so you can call on them for emergencies when you need them. So key takeaways from today, number one, small unmanned aircraft systems are going to fill the air gap for type four to five incidents and can really be used for every incident type. Number two, aerial imagery from drones will provide substantial ROI when properly matched with an appropriate mission. Three, small unmanned aircraft systems represent an emerging technology that still has substantial limitations similar to AOL dial-up service in the 1990s. Drones can't map out an entire county. Um, I mean, large military ones could, but the small unmanned aircraft systems, they're good for neighborhoods, um, maybe large, uh, you know, two, three miles most, but don't expect them to cover an entire county uh, in a day. It's just really not possible with most of these systems. Um, number four, most public safety drone programs are work in progress. Uh, there's still a little ways to go, but they're coming along nicely and they're making really good progress. Five, drones are making significant impacts on emergency management, and these impacts are going to be increasing while also becoming more dramatic and more pronounced. Number six, local public safety drone teams should be able to handle most of the workload during small incidents. But for number seven, for larger mass casualty or mass damage incidents, uh, have emergency contracts in place with experienced drone service providers. Again, why would you buy a fleet of dump trucks if you can rent them to haul debris after a storm? Eight, your most valuable players are the data managers, the GIS specialists, and the audiovisual techs. 
Um, they're really going to get the data where it needs to go and get them into actionable intelligence products. Remote pilots are increasingly becoming kind of an expanding commodity, but still a much needed commodity. Number nine, when building a small UAS program, crawl before you walk, establish a culture of aviation safety and risk management within your organization. And finally, air and drone responders are working to support small UAS use by public safety and emergency service organizations across the US and around the world. And with that, I think we're, I'm gonna throw this back to Terry in a second, because I know she's got a, a real special Mente meter uh, exercise we're gonna do to learn a little bit more about what you think about how these systems can be used. So Terry, over to you. Perfect, yes. So we have one more uh, kind of poll for you all today. We wanna to hear from you after you've heard Chris talk uh, about all the great things they're doing. What types of missions or projects do you believe could benefit from the use of aerial imagery collected by drones? Um, Chris shared a lot, but we're interested to know, you know, either projects you are using imagery for or that you have ideas for that could be used um, in projects in your, your community or your organization. We'd love to hear that. So you can use the QR code uh, or there should be a link in the chat. I'm not following the chat, but I believe it's there. Uh, so you can either go to menti.com, thank you, Charlotte, and type in the code here. You can scan the QR code or just copy and paste the link in your browser. And I am going to leave this up here for just a second, and then I'm going to switch over to the results. But while I'm thinking about it, Chris, I think so far you get the quote of the day. And I, actually, I captured a few of them, but the, the quote so far for Inspire Day 2 is, include your GIS teams up front. I think anyone who is a technologist or a GIS analyst on, uh, on the session today uh, cheered silently when you said that because it's so important. So I appreciate you uh, mentioning that today. It, it's so true. And yeah, we can't stress that enough. So our pleasure. Thank you. And thank you. Um, and so I'm going to try to see, oh, we're got, I could have switched already. We're getting lots of, uh, all right. Are you seeing my screen here? Yes. Yep. Wow. So damage assessment, search and rescue, public works projects. Yeah. And, and that is really interesting because we've been saying more and more frequently that public works projects is, is a increasingly area for these systems. Flood, firefighting. Yeah, these are, these are great. I know Charles is probably looking at this dreaming a little bit. He's probably <laughs> trying to take some massive notes right now. Well, we'll keep this open. So, you know, keep adding them in. We knew that you all would have more than one thought on this. So you can, you know, add in more ideas as we go along, but I appreciate you all contributing this. This is fascinating to see some of the applications that you all think are uh, ha either happening or potential. So we have, we're, we're running low on time, but I appreciate uh, our, our panelists have been answering questions in the, um, in the in the background so we're gonna move on and uh i won't ask you any questions just yet chris and we'll go on to our, our next thing but i want to thank you for speaking and all the things that you shared today and i'll share some more of my favorite quotes from what you said later on when we get to our next panelist so with that Thanks, Terry. <laughs> sure thing so with that um i am going to turn it over to our next presenter Charles Werner. Um, he is the retired Charlottesville fire chief and 46 year public safety veteran. Um, and Charles has served in numerous leadership roles at the local state national levels on public safety initiatives and presently serves as director of drone responders, public safety Alliance, the board of directors on ERTS and appointed by Virginia governor Northam to serve on the secure and resilient Commonwealth panel, as well as a public safety US sub panel chair. Chief Werner is a FAA certifi certified remote pilot and also serves on the Virginia Center for Innovative Technologies Unmanned Systems Advisory Board. So with that, I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Terry. Uh, it's great to be here. So today we're gonna go into uh, an expansion of what Chris already talked about as far as the, the many uses and the explosion that we're seeing in the drone world. And we're gonna talk today about a global public safety database and map. This next slide is an illustration. Every one of these pictures uh, is a video capture from drone imagery. And it just kind of shows the wide variety uh, of how drones are being used globally. 
In 2020, Eric Drone Responders did a public safety UAS survey, and I'm going to revisit some of this. And I know we covered once before, but it's relevant to where we're headed and why we're talking about it. So when we looked at what's the discipline <clears throat> breakdown for drone usage, <clears throat> excuse me, it was clear law enforcement is ahead by 42%, followed by fire rescue at about 38%. Emergency management at about 12%, and other areas like search and rescue, uh, EMS starting to come into play uh, with the remainder. When we looked at the use cases, this is the response we got back. It was over 17 public safety use cases for drones. And what is interesting about this is, in addition to this, this, this list of use cases, you can subdivide each one of these down into three or four smaller, smaller subcategories uh, where we're seeing it being specifically used. So again, the point here is the, the magnitude and the diversity in ways that public safety is beginning to use drones. And how have drones made a difference in public safety? Well, first, they provide enhanced safety for civilians and responders. They've increased operational effectiveness by giving us that, that airborne view, as Chris mentioned, that there's an air gap for many places are able to see. And then it's providing real-time situational awareness so we can see things as they're happening, as they're unfolding. And again, uh, this is data information. It's video streaming in such a way that in a lot of times that situational awareness is being shared in real time where, as Chris mentioned before as well, we don't need to have as much radio traffic and then for disaster response and recovery. So the problem is that there is no database of public safety UAS programs. And the reason that's a problem is we have learned that public safety unmanned aircraft systems programs advance far greater and faster when we're able to share our best practices and our lessons learned. That is probably having the biggest impact on increasing drone programs in public safety and what those programs are doing. Right now, there's an estimated 4,000 public safety UAS programs in the United States alone. The problem is <clears throat> we don't have any real way to communicate with all these UAS programs in a network to where we can share best practices, lessons learned, or safety messages to facilitate training opportunities or new training programs, to partner with neighboring UAS programs, even to find out which ones are around us and nearby that we might be able to use in a major disaster, to deploy for disasters and significant incidents when needed, and to coordinate and prevent duplicate imagery. We see a great deal of, uh, of duplicative effort because people don't know what's out there uh, that's already been done or what's planned to be done. We're hoping that with our, our partnership with Esri, we'll be doing some things you'll hear more about. So the answer is developing a global public safety UAS program database and map. And in order to do this, we had to reach out to get some resources and some partners to help make this uh, become a reality. So we as drone responders in cooperation with ERT have reached out to the Ames, NASA Ames Research Center in California, and they are providing interns for us who have helped to develop uh, the Survey123 tool to begin collecting this information about the programs, uh, locating the programs, and then partnering with Esri to take all that information in by the Survey123 tool right into ArcGIS and start building a map as we collect the data. What this is going to do is really start taking the information to be able to show people in a variety of different ways. Uh, we can use different dashboards to pull up information to show all the programs in the United States, just law enforcement programs, just fire service programs, or whatever we might be looking for, and then be able to click into that and to see what the information is there and hopefully to have the contact information that's gonna be available. So as I mentioned, we'll be using the Survey123 tool. This has been, uh, the survey itself has been developed by the NASA Ames interns. And I'm gonna see if I can switch screens. Did that switch for you to see? It did not. You might have to stop sharing and reshare a new screen. Okay. Can you see the screen at all now? I am seeing a global database and map. Okay, so let me go back here. I'm gonna to try to stop share and share screen again. 
And are you seeing that? No share. Hmm. Share screen. Share screen. Share. Now are you seeing yes, the Global Public excellent. Safety U.S. Drone Program Registration? Yep. Okay, so this is the example of the survey one, two, three uh, survey put together by the NASA Ames uh, interns. <clears throat> and I'm just gonna scroll down. We're in the process of finalizing and double checking our, our capture of the data to make sure it's well, but this will provide all this different information available to those people um, that are looking to find out about the other programs. So it's gonna give us that first opportunity to see uh, what the other programs look like. So now I'm gonna go back to my other screen. You should see the survey one, two, three screen again. Perfect. Okay, so at the end of the day, we're gonna have uh, not only a nationwide uh, database and map, but we're gonna also have a global map, which is gonna go beyond the United States to the other countries. And we have several other partners that are gonna help to push this out to the other communities. And now we're gonna have a much larger network of being able to share the information that we discussed. So the global database and map, will be a database of public safety UAS programs, uh, a map, a dashboard of different views that we can turn off and on. Uh, we're also partners with the National Geotech Center who has also offered to provide some interns to help develop some of the resources and to create an ultimately an information sharing network. And then the end goal is that we will import this information into FEMA's Incident Resource Inventory System or IRIS database and, and we'll have identified through the survey, are the, the resources and assets that are in the database willing to be deployed uh, for emergencies and disasters? And here you can see that whole IRIS process of how that plays into it. So with that, I'm gonna wrap up and say that uh, Drone Responders is out there for you to take advantage of. Uh, DroneResponders.org is the website, membership is free. We have just exceeded 3,800 members with participation from 48 countries. Uh, we have the largest online collection of public safety U.S. documents, SOPs, best practices, lessons learned, training information, and more. And I will reinforce what Chris said earlier, uh, and Terry said was this, the, the, the big quote of the day. Um, what we're seeing now is the biggest impact that is going to come from drone imagery is being able to integrate that into GIS and be able to provide meaningful layers of information that can show us damage assessments that can be easily uh, transported into uh, the uh, portal that we're going to have uh, and connect with FEMA. So now that imagery goes out. Plus, as disasters uh, unfold or as storms are looming, uh, it will create a mechanism for FEMA to be able to reach out to those assets in the area and coordinate some activities where they may not have been able to do it before because the information wasn't available. And um, here's my contact information and I'll turn it back over to you, Terry. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Charles. You all have been quite busy getting this initiative off the ground. I love the approach and the partnerships that you've formed to do this right. So, you know, NAPSIC had coordinated with everyone on this panel, FEMA, states and regions, and UIS and imagery collectors during that string of hurricanes in the fall. And it was incredibly clear that this was needed. It seemed like such a simple question, what teams are flying and where? And we found that it wasn't that easy to figure out. So I appreciate that you all didn't just try to go out and solve this on your own, but you sought guidance from the FEMA NIC and identified the resource typing standards, that being RTLT and IRIS, which is the distributed inventory system provided by FEMA that you both mentioned. So, and that you were just so very thoughtful about this process. So thank you all for, you know, this initiative and sharing what you're doing. And we have, um, I think a link will go in the chat for more information a little bit later for how people can get involved. So thank you, Charles. Um, I'll do the same thing. We'll, we'll save some of the questions that are popping up in the Q and A uh, for later, because folks are, are bringing them in and we're answering some of them in the background. So what I will do is go ahead and introduce our next speaker. And thank you again, Charles. I have the pleasure of introducing someone NAPSIG has also worked very closely with for some time, Mr. Austin Worcester. Austin is the Senior Program Manager for SUAS at Headquarters Civil Air Patrol. He is currently leading and manages the largest SUAS fleet and organization in the US. He's a retired Assistant Fire Chief and 
paramedic. Mr. Worcester has spent over 35 years in public safety and emergency management leading operations at the local, state, federal, and international levels. Thank you, Austin. I'll turn it over to you. Hey, good morning or afternoon, depending on where you are. Thanks, everybody, for taking the time to, to join us here. We're just going to talk briefly about what CAPS Small Unmanned Aerial System Program is doing uh, and a little bit of what we've done, but some considerations that we continue to see um, in response operations. Uh, we are essentially right now FEMA's uh, Small Unmanned Aerial Systems SMEs and have provided response operations now for the past several years to support them. So just a little bit about us here at the Civil Air Patrol. We were founded a week before Pearl Harbor's attacks. Um, CAP performed um, missions, primarily anti-submarine missions along the uh, Gulf and the Atlantic seaboard. Um, and we were actually performing combat missions uh, in those things as armed aircraft owned by our members. We don't do those combat missions anymore. We are now the Air Force Auxiliary. Uh, with the birth of the Air Force, we became legally the Air Force Auxiliary. We're in all 50 states, uh, D.C., and then Port Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands share a wing, and we can respond and support any U.S. territory, and we do occasionally go outside the U.S. on special requests. Uh, we are 66,000 volunteer members strong. It's supported by about 200 or less full-time employees. And we are one of those organizations that's relatively rare. We can um, handle and exploit satellite imagery, fixed wing aircraft imagery in the traditional aviation world. We are the largest single owner of Cessna aircraft in the world. Um, we are the largest single owner of UAS in the world. So then we get down into that um, little area. We're well over 2000 UAS aircraft that are registered with the FAA. And we do a little bit of everything from Homeland Security to disaster relief. Uh, the big sexy mission that everybody sees us in is search and rescue. Uh, we do about 90% of aviation SAR in the United States uh, that the Air Force Rescue Center assigns. But we also do counter UAS and then our DOD federal, state, and local partners. So our goal is that we can get a UAS team to any part of our nation within four hours and have them overhead. We're well on our way. Our goal with our fixed wing uh, fleet is to have an aircraft overhead in two hours, and that is something we can currently accomplish. So we're getting um, a lot of bang for our buck these days. Um, we have over 1,500 Part 107 certificated pilots, but our mission training as um, Bo Charles and Chris said is that you've got to go beyond part 107. Um, so our pilots are tested to the NIST standard. Our minimum training for our mission pilots, and it's a set curriculum, is 80 hours above that part 107. But we also have countless recreational pilots flying in the recreational world because our missions also include aerospace education, STEM, and cadet programs. We have cadets aged 12 up to 21 who participate actively in our responses. So we're doing a lot of different sensors um, over all kinds of different operations. Uh, if it's been a, a major declared disaster, uh, odds are FEMA has employed either our fixed wing aviation assets or our small UAS or both to support them. And we use um, high-end electro-optical sensors. That's the military speak term for um, 4K optical uh, standard cameras, but we're also using multi-spectral cameras, um, which allow us to look at vegetation, especially in the wild fan, uh, land fire world. We use long, long wave infrared, which most people think of as FLIR, but it is actually a, a definition of long wave infrared. And we do use LIDAR, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, we're beginning to research ground penetrating radar to support urban search and rescue. Um, we are the current um, supplier for small UAS to the federal urban search and rescue community um, with FEMA. Uh, we're we've been deploying with them now for the last year uh, to the ISTs to be deployed with the teams in the field as needed. But we, su we suspect that uh, mounting ground penetrating radar on our, some of our larger UAS will give us the ability to assist them in buried 
um, building collapse situations. But we continue to grow. We like to say we're on the leading edge, but we're not on the bleeding edge of, of technology. Um, for me to change out our entire fleet costs millions of dollars. So we're always looking at the next best thing, but it has to be sustainable and supportable. As um, Chris alluded to earlier, there is the problem with uh, Chinese-based UAS. The National Defense Authorization Act prohibits uh, Chinese-built UAS and the use of federal money um, to purchase those under the Defense Department. We're kind of a schizophrenic organization. Sometimes we're a Title 36 organization, uh, just like the Red Cross, a congressionally chartered humanitarian organization. But when we're in our supporting federal agency roles, federal law requires us that we be in our Title 10 role and subject to DOD rules. Um, so anytime we're in our FEMA support or uh, assisting another federal agency, we're in that Title 10 role. And then we're prohibited from using uh, these Chinese built UAS. So an emerging company that's been out there for a few years and is taking our industry by storm now is Skydio. Um, Skydio currently um, works with us quite a bit. Uh, we've currently fielded 150 of their Skydio 2 aircraft, uh, which gets us about one per 25,000 square miles in the US. They're built across our incident command post. Um, each of our incident command posts has a UAS response capability, and there are 150 uh, of those across the country. Flight testing right now with prototypes from the Defense Innovation Unit, we've ordered a little over a million dollars of these. Um, now, with our ultimate goal of meeting that 150 aircraft co-located with the Skydio 2s, the big key to the Skydio X2 Delta is, is that it is DOD approved as Blue UAS. Um, the drawback to the Skydio X2 is that it's about $30,000 an aircraft, much like some of the larger um, uh, DJI aircraft like the Matrice 210. One of the big issues that you need to start thinking about is security. And it's not just about providing real-time imagery to our potential adversaries. It's about giving them inadvertent access to your networks, which could result in ransomware attacks, um, disruption of service attacks. So you have to think about what you're doing and can your system be hacked um, and provide unintended information to somebody who shouldn't have it. Um, as we said, when we're in our Title 10 status, we're limited to those aircraft that are approved by the Air Force Special Operations Command. Uh, they're the um, military SMEs, subject matter experts, when it comes to uh, small UAS. There is an exception for counter UAS testing, training, and research. We do those frequently with uh, our federal partners. Um, and our folks are providing that red air capability where they're flying against our security forces um, in response community uh, where they can employ their counter UAS systems against a real world target flying um, in patterns that our adversaries are doing. So our fixed wing, we do a wide variety of aircraft. This is the Event 38 E384. It's designed as a large area mapping UAV. It's got a 90 minute stay time on its battery. Um, we are looking at hybrid aircraft that would give us three to four hours of stay time. Um, but this particular aircraft is about 90 minutes. It has a Sony R10C mapping camera in it, and it's designed to map over a thousand acres on one battery. And we take those images and we stitch them ourselves and do our own um, processing. Our teams are trained to do that work in an internet denied environment. Um, we typically use PIX4D or um, Esri site scan. Um, with Chris at, at AIRT and Charles over at Drone Responders, we all work together, we're partners. Um, I sit on uh, Charles's advisory panel. Um, but we're always looking for our ways to do things. And our folks are trained to provide that information to our customers, um, even in that internet denied environment. So they can provide that basic GIS capability, get it to our GIS cell um, at our headquarters unit. And we actually have an emerging GIS program uh, within CAP. It's run by a gentleman who in his day job works at the NGA. Um, 
and uh, we're expanding our GIS capability at the request of FEMA to support them during major response operations. So when you see the word AFAM, that stands for Air Force Assigned Mission. So we have to use uh, approved aircraft in that. The Instant I Mark III Gen 4 is one of our aircraft that we use for that. It contains a dual sensor, just like the Skydio X2D does, uh, both long wave IR and 4K video. Um, the T960 is our heavy lift aircraft and it's carrying a LIDAR sensor. I'll show you what we did with that here shortly. Um, but that was used in Puerto Rico most recently. So this is an example of using both fixed wing air assets with UAV assets. We uh, employ a camera system that we call Waldo um, for the Where's Waldo. It's an X camera with a 4K camera that provides us the ability to, to create 3D models of events uh, in very high resolution from about 2,500 feet in the air. They identified some potential buckling of a wastewater treatment plant in Guayanica, Puerto Rico post-earthquake. Uh, we were able to deploy one of our UAV teams that was in theater there, um, assisting in the damage assessments. We had aircraft in the air over 10 minutes um, over that area, and we were able to determine that the damage was minor and did not require evacuation of the surrounding area. Um, one of our recent uh, missions was to help map with both our fixed wing systems and our UAV systems, the power grid in Puerto Rico post earthquake and post um, Hurricane Maria. Uh, Puerto Rico is always on a single point of failure. Uh, they have a, um, their power grid is dependent on uh, bunker oil and diesel fuel for their entire power grid. They don't have any um, self-sustaining power resources there. Um, but they had to rebuild their grid after the, the tornadoes or earthquakes and um, landslides and the hurricane. So we flew that uh, and identified some areas that were supposedly repaired. And as you can see, uh, they were repaired, but improperly. And this assisted FEMA in making a $6 billion decision um, whether to fund the repairs or not. Um, so uh, very cost effective for us. We only charge about uh, $25 a flight hour for our UAVs. Our aircraft, fixed wing aircraft is currently about $175 for our fixed wing aircraft. This is the Waldo X cam and we used it. Uh, this is recently in North Carolina post a hurricane uh, where we were able to sow some washed out roads, flooded roads and help identify in 3D what the issues are. In Puerto Rico, it's the first time we've employed LIDAR. Uh, one of the things we did with uh, the problem with Puerto Rico is, is that they had multiple disasters one right after another. And it became an issue for FEMA to decide how do we cost what to what? Which disaster gets the, the bill for what building? So we flew LIDAR over specific areas where they had pre-event LIDAR um, from MIT. And then we flew it again and we were able to show debris volume, we were able to show building shift um, between one disaster to another. So in this case, this particular green line in the bottom right corner showed what the building roof looked like um, pre-earthquake. This is post-earthquake, so they know the hurricane didn't do this, that the earthquake did it, they charge it to the hurricane. Um, just one of the many different ways you can use UAV data. Um, our Waldo collection, uh, this is a Tennessee um, tornado damage. Uh, one of the great things about this is we can fly long tracks of, of damage in a short period of time, produce that high resolution 3D imagery, but then we can overlay in specific areas where we need to UAV data. And that increases the resolution to the point in many cases where we're down to a tenth of a centimeter per pixel. And that gives you the ability to look at a bridge rivet. You see as the, as the bridge shifted, as the electric substation got some minor damage that wouldn't normally be seen from an aerial image. But one of the great things we're doing now is taking all of that data and using a contractor with artificial intelligence doing damage assessments in real time, uh, which speeds this up. Uh, this is Arkansas, I believe. Um, the yellow is a minor damage, orange is major damage, um, red is severe and the purple are destroyed structures. 
And so what the, and as we zoom in, you can see a little bit more and more as I keep going in. Um, this gives you real quickly the ability to do your financial calculations for damage assessment to get it back so you can get that major disaster declaration that much quicker. Uh, the best example I can use for that is we flew this um, last year around this time of year, uh, Southern Mississippi sustained uh, an EF4 and an EF3 within a mile of each other in the space of a week. So we flew the same damage pass with this equipment. They found that our UAV imagery gave them better damage assessments than their ground folks because their ground folks were blocked by trees and may not see a building that was hidden back in the, in the woods a little bit where we were able to see that. We were able to apply our AI damage and have all of that information back to them within 48 hours so that they could get that major disaster declaration that much quicker. So some important considerations with UAS response and imagery, and I'm just gonna keep it simple. Know the that, that type of response that you plan to do. Are you gonna be flying earthquakes? Are you flying structure fires? Are you flying in support of law enforcement? Uh, know what you're gonna do train, fly, and practice. You've got to train the way you fight so that you fight the way you train. It should be an automatic kind of thing. You have to have that right equipment. That best thing for you may be that um, DJI aircraft that is $2,400 and gets you great pictures and you know how to process them and do all those kind of things. That may be what you need. Or you may need that larger aircraft, depending on what you do. Or you may need a variety of them. Um, and you've got to build these relationships ahead of time. I'll talk about some issues as they come up here in just a minute, but find the folks that have done this before. And I'm a big believer in creative appropriation. Use their standard operating guidelines. Charles's group has the greatest library for all of that kind of stuff. Um, our stuff is on our website at gocivilairpatrol.com. Uh, you may have to hunt around a little bit to find it, but it's all on the public side. You can see our training materials, our standard operating guidelines, our interagency guidelines, because we work so often with our partners in the Forest Service or FEMA, and we're using ground forces, UAVs, fixed wing aircraft, uh, and we have to deconflict all of those kind of things. So you've got to build these relationships well ahead of time. The other thing is you've got to be self-supporting. If you're deploying into a disaster area, the worst thing you can do is to have to rely on their infrastructure, uh, their food. You're already stressing an already stressed system. Make sure that you've got your own food and water, shelter, and a place to go to the bathroom. Uh, people don't think about those kind of things normally. Um, when I was managing medical responses for um, the tornadoes in Joplin or Haiti um, post-earthquake, uh, we'd get plenty of volunteers, but they'd show up with no self-supporting stuff. They didn't even bring food and water in many cases. And so we'd have to scramble to help them out. The other thing is you've got to know your legal environment that you're flying, flying in, and you have to know how to get those waivers quickly. With the FAA, they have a 24 seven hotline at the Security Operations Support Center, the SOSC. Um, if you go to part 107 emergency waivers, online. They'll take you to their website. That's how you can apply for that emergency waiver. We routinely do this. I, I talk to those folks probably about four times or five times a week, uh, getting beyond visual line of sight waivers, getting night waivers, getting, although that's becoming a thing of the past here shortly, um, getting weather waivers uh, because people don't get lost and bad things don't happen and airplanes don't crash in good weather typically. Um, the other thing you need to be aware of is what your state and local government have when it comes to privacy and PII concerns. Some states have some very interesting laws when it comes to UAV use. You've got to make sure that you're not going to go afoul of them. We do maintain a library of um, state regulations uh, to keep our folks up but it's incumbent on you to know what you're doing in your own, own environment. Like, for example, North Carolina has both a government license requirement uh, for UAVs and a commercial license environment. Make sure that you're licensed the way you are. They're both free. You have to take a short test for that state. Other states have to, you have to register your UAV with that state. Just make sure you know what you're doing in your legal thing. 
Um, always have recharging capability for everything. That seems simple, but a big thing is backups to backups to backups. Um, we typically deploy a kit with a minimum of four batteries and we maintain a bank of batteries for our different types of UAVs. Uh, the big issue we run into is we're flying 23 different types of UAVs out there right now, um, so that we have to be able to support that. And you have to be able to process yourself. You shouldn't rely solely on those cloud-based processing systems. Drone deploy, um, drone deploy and all of those kind of things that are out there, <clears throat> um, Kitty Hawk, uh, those things to do that post-processing is very, they're great and they work fast. And SightScan is another one of those at Esri we use a lot of, um, but they don't work if you're in an internet denied environment. And oftentimes immediately post-disaster in a large scale disaster, you're going to be in that internet denied environment. So if you don't know how to post-process your imagery, um, if your customer wants a, a geo-rectified ortho mosaic and you can't do that, you're not going to be able to deliver what you need to do. So know what, you, what your customers are going to need and be prepared to do that and do that post-processing yourself. And there we go. A couple of few other big points. Know your limitations. Never, ever promise what you can't deliver. We're a fledgling profession. And I tell our folks all the time when we train them, it's only going to take one serious whoops to do serious damage to our profession. Um, you know, fly it into a UH-60 um, or our county UAS guys flying um, in support of the Air Force. If you plant, I always tell them, if you accidentally plant that into Air Force One, we probably won't be doing that mission anymore. Um, so kind of use your brain and don't promise what you can't deliver. You have to stay within the law. You have to stay within the law. I can't preach that enough. Uh, many departments I see, and I fly for not just CAP, but I fly for our local county fire department, and I fly for the sheriff's office. You cannot um, fly in these kind of environments uh, if you're not if you don't know what you're doing. Uh, I keep seeing imagery illegally obtained. The best one I, I just recently saw was down here in. in Alabama, which is where I live, uh, a storm chaser uh, decided to put his UAV up and chase a tornado beyond visual line of sight in less than VFR conditions. And that's the kind of stuff that will do damage to us as an organization. Um, and make sure that you understand what your customer wants and needs to know. The biggest issue with that is that um, sometimes that they have an unrealistic expectation of what our capabilities truly are when it comes to UAV. I actually had a, an EM director say he wanted us to image the Mississippi River Valley and the rest of his state and with UAVs. And we just had to manage those expectations. Um, said some of this is more realistic for fixed wing aircraft. Some of this is more realistic for UAVs. It really depends on what your situation is. But no, sometimes you've got to ask them specifically, what is it that they want to see? Follow up with your customer, make sure you got what they wanted. Um, nothing's worse than saying, okay, I've done my mission, here's your card, wash your hands, be done with it. Um, please don't do that, follow up with them. If they didn't get what they wanted, go back out and do it again. Um, make sure you replace all your media. Make sure you know where to store your media. Um, CAP is not in the intelligence business and we are specifically not an intelligence agency uh, by DOD definition. So we have to be very careful with PII. The way we manage that is our customers own that image. It's incumbent on them when we hand it over to them. We don't store it. We don't maintain it. We just hand it off. And so their PII issues, um, it becomes their issue. We don't get involved in that. And the final thing is, is maintenance, maintenance, maintenance. These are aircraft. They are not built to FAA standards, and they have little connectors and all kinds of issues sometimes. If you don't take care of your aircraft, and maintain them regularly, you're gonna have failures. And failures in some cases can hurt people. So there's my contact information. I'm always available. I'm always happy to talk to anybody that wants to, to do it. If you need us and you have an emergency, your local government official, um, 
for all of our normal stuff. It's our 24 seven operations center, um, which is based here at Maxwell Air Force Base. Uh, there's our 800 number or and our email that's monitored 24 seven as well. Um, if you're asking us to do a search and rescue mission that actually has to go to the Air Force Rescue Coordination Center because more often than not, they'll cover the cost of that. Um, and you'll get, you know, we're just basically gonna be your Air Force for your small community. Um, as Chris said about, uh, there are very few uh, fire police departments in the nation that have their own aviation program. We're here to help you all and we're more than willing to do that. Terry, this one's back to you. Awesome, thank you so much. I'm gonna take back over. All right, so thank you, Austin. I uh, I really appreciate all the things you touched on and how you're all taking imagery collection one step further and working with your partners to exploit the imagery for the end user. That is often your emergency manager, your incident managers who are super busy and don't have time to sift through hundreds of photos. So I appreciate you sharing that. Um, and you, along with everyone on this panel has shared a lot of considerations for folks to think through and prepare for during blue skies. I think we all heard loud and clear that leveraging drones and imagery from drones takes a lot of planning, education, and training. So before we get into a discussion here, we do have a few more minutes, so we can kind of keep going. Um, Austin, I wanted to ask how, how do states and locals build that relationship with you now? Where do they start? This kind of addresses some of the questions that are coming in from Daniel and a few others on, you know, what are your capabilities? How do they work with you now to understand what you can do and when? So those things are in place prior to a disaster. What I'd recommend is that you reach out to your individual state. Um, every CAP is in thousands of communities across the nation. And in many cases, that's the only contact with the Air Force a small community may ever have. Um, so reach out to your local community if you have a squadron or a unit there. Um, or you can reach out to the wing level folks. Uh, they can always point you in the right direction and build those. But many, many if not most state governments already have MOUs in place with the Civil Air Patrol. Um, every single state has one for uh, search and rescue with the Air Force Rescue Center. Um, and they're the ones that tag us for search and rescue. But that's the best way to begin those relationships well ahead of time. Um, every state emergency management agency should know how to get hold of us and use us um, because we do missions for them all the time. Uh, on any given day, there are probably 50 missions going on for us nationwide supporting some level of state or local government. And I'm guessing, uh, you know, what your capabilities are vary by regions. You're broken out by, was it regions or districts? Um, each wing is the state, and then we're broken up by regions on top of that back to the national headquarters. And so, yes, our, the capability um, is we try to keep it standardized across the country, but, um, as we build our capabilities, we're adding more and more mission sets, like our GIS capability. Our cell phone forensics folks are the best in the nation and have saved over 50 lives this year. Um, we're kind of the best kept secret in the Air Force, as they say, as auxiliarists. Um, but we do about 80% of um, First Air Force's support on any given day. Um, thank you. So there are more questions for you, Austin, in the q and I'll give you a chance to kind of read through those and I'll come back to you. But I know each one of your organizations provide a lot of information. I mean, you, you, you hit all the highlights today. But so, for example, Eric, I know you have a lot of training and technical support. Um, some folks were even asking, you know, for outside the U.S. Can you expand on that? You know, I know you, you answered some of that in the typing it, but for the group to hear. Yeah, so we, I mean, we've got a core team that will respond uh, when requested, and that's for pre-planned incidents or, uh, or disasters. And then we have uh, standby pilots uh, located around the U.S. and internationally capable of providing services. They all have different levels of capabilities based on their experience, their training in, in the aircraft. Part of what we're doing in conjunction with the, the project that, uh, 
that Drone Responders is launching to get the, the UAS programs categorized is we're going to be doing the same thing at the specific pilot level to update our database and broaden our database to have those resources uh, allocated throughout across the US and, and hopefully around the world um, where we can cherry pick pilots as we need them for whatever the mission sets are. And, I, and we saw some, some questions coming in. Do you have LIDAR? Um, typically, we don't have LIDAR in, on our, our aircraft. We have access to to aircraft with LIDAR and we can pull those resources in when we need to. And I, I should also point out that, um, and I know, Terry, you're going to be showing a, a slide that asks for if people want to get more involved with any of the organizations to, to enter in their, their email address. And one of the things I would encourage is we're really looking for a lot of GIS help as well. So if you want to participate in disaster response, um, either in the field or even from the comfort of your own office or workspace, uh, we can always use that help. We've got a variety of projects. Again, we're doing some testing with Esri on these things. So we'd love to get some professionals who really understand ArcGIS, ArcGIS Online, all the different Esri tools involved with what we're doing so we can uh, flesh out this workflow just a little bit further. Well, you're talking to the right people. We get lots of questions. We actually have um, an on-demand session about um, how GIS can, uh, you know, analysts can, you know, work in disasters, support remotely, get that kind of training. So um, we'll make sure that they, you know, see that link at the end. Um, one of the things that you had also talked about was, you know, uh, you know, how do agencies who are looking to start a drone program, and I, I think you have on your website some information for um, where do they go if they're interested in getting this going? So droneresponders.org is really um, the, the best place to go. And you can even send a message. I know Charles is very active on answering uh, specific messages from a lot of people who are starting up their programs, but there's a wealth of information there in the, uh, in the resource center. And, and we should probably bring Charles in a little bit to talk more about that if he wants to pop on. He's busy typing in the background. There you go. Oh, I'm, I'm here. Um, yeah, I think so. What we've done at Drone Responders is we've tried to create a collective of information. So we have uh, information that comes from DOJ, from PERF, uh, from all different places on starting a program. So you can come in to, to Drone Responders and join. It's free. And then you can go into the Resource Center. And when you go into the Resource Center, the first folder you'll come to is starting a program. And within that starting a program, it goes through everything from considerations, guidelines, you know, just guidance documents on how to start a program, COA information, the declaration letters that you need to submit if you're gonna do a COA, all that stuff is in here. Plus we just recently added uh, an entire 55 page COA guidance document that has screenshots to the entire uh, COA application process through the FAA from the FAA and Brandon Carver, with Caroline, Texas. So a lot of work's been done. They will actually walk you through those things that everybody else has had the pain of going through, uh, and and as and as Chris mentioned, um, we do take people and involve them in the process, and so we're looking at specifically at SiteScan as a tool that can be used in in conjunction with many of the departments or agencies across the country that already have ArcGIS and Esri, that can be able to use that and put the imagery directly into a portal that we're going to be working with uh, Esri to to put a place that will immediately be accessible by FEMA. So that's what's coming. And, and Terry, one thing I'll just add in is, um, you know, if you are looking to start a program before you even go into drone responders, again, going back to, I think my presentation, a couple basic questions, who's going to be responsible for it? Is it somebody that who really has a passion for either the tech or for aviation, or are they being voluntold? Number two, um, do you have access to funding? Uh, is there a budget or grants available? Because too often we're seeing, um, leadership and public safety agencies want to have a drone program because they know that it's it's available and, and everybody else is doing it. But you really got to understand what are you trying to accomplish with it? Like at the end of the day, what are the expectations and make sure you're going in to that process realistically to set yourself up for success. And then all these tools of drone responders and civil air patrol are going to become even more valuable. And we have a considerations guideline document that actually walks you through that process of thinking. And we have a community outreach program that's a blank template that walks you through town hall meetings and all those kind of things that you can put your name on and develop your own outreach program to make sure you're totally engaging your community and being transparent. That's great. No one wants to recreate the wheel. You guys have done all the legwork. Uh, so appreciate that everyone that's attending today has some interest in this. So it's great that they know where to go. They don't have to start from the beginning. You guys have all kind of done all the hard work for them. Um, before I go on to the next thing, um, 
Austin, I saw you answering a lot of questions in the background. Appreciate that. Was there anything that struck you that you wanted to bring up for the good of the order in those last few? It was more a question of what we use to, to do our post-processing. Um, we use site scan quite a bit. It's a great way to push data into the Esri world um, because it's an Esri product. So there's that compatibility across all the platforms that we use. But we also use PIX4D, um, drone deploy. And what we're doing in the field is we train all of our folks to use um, Metashape, which is a, a relatively inexpensive uh, photo stitching program that sits on just a laptop or a, a desktop um, in cooperation with Erfran View and QGIS, which are freeware, um, so that our folks can do that post-processing in that internet denied environment. That's great. I, um, I'm envisioning a part three. <laughs> so we, we did our prep tech talk, we had this today, but with, uh, I, I'm envisioning, and we haven't agreed on this yet, but you know this this next level of this technical implementation and where GIS folks can learn from the processes that you guys are working through with Esri and SiteScan all that stuff. So I'm excited about next steps already. We haven't even gotten there yet. So um, I want to thank you all for just being with us today and sharing all your great work. I'm going to um, put up your information one last time so everyone can bombard you, but. Uh, if you want to, again, capture this QR code or this link to get more information from each of these groups um, and stay informed on this initiative and maybe participate in the future, they would love to work with you. Um, we'd be excited if you did that. I think it's also going to be in the chat, uh, so you can grab it there. It won't go away. We'll make sure we, we keep it um, uh, on the NAPSIG site as well. So before I go to the next slide, and it's going to be in the chat, so here we go. Um, so we have uh, lots more with Inspire. We're still getting started here and I wanted to just share some exciting things that are coming up next. So for those of you who have attended our summit in the past, you've experienced our tabletop exercise. And um, that is where we bring, uh, we have players representing all levels of government, ICS positions, and we weave in the latest and best practices and technology and data. And we are incredibly lucky this year to have the US Naval Postgraduate School Center for Homeland Defense and Security conducting an interactive seminar this afternoon, which is a very rare opportunity. They are in high demand for delivering this crisis leadership seminar. So we are very grateful to them and hope you will come back at one Eastern to take advantage of that opportunity. And I also have some sessions on here that I think you all might be interested in and kind of expand on the things that were talked about. So we have another live session called the National Roundtable Emergency, Emerging Technology and Preparedness. And during that session, we'll hear more of the technical uh, behind the scenes of that AI for damage assessment. So if you heard what Austin talked about today, this will be another session that'll give you even more insights into how they are exploiting imagery to deliver actionable information to you know, emergency managers in a very rapid way through AI. Um, we'll also hear about the National Resource Hub. I think this will be the first time they will be presenting on this to the public. So this is kind of that next level of IRIS and RTLT um, that we will see that um, inventory feed into. So all the things that ART and drone responders are all working on to de de develop this inventory will migrate into this new system. So I think you should tune in and, and hear about that. It's very exciting. We have an on-demand session, imagery collection for resilience, response, and recovery. Civil Air Patrol curated that. We also have USGS talking about some of their innovations um, in drones. Uh, we have a, a cool vignette on hail, so it's very exciting stuff. And lastly, uh, we have a whole on-demand session on mutual aid and resource management 101. So it gives you all the behind the scenes on how we've gotten where we are with IRIS, RTLT, and, um, and the National Resource Hub. So uh, all the things you could possibly want about those topics and more. So with that, um, thank you all again for attending. We hope to see you back at a future Inspire session. Um, thank you again to our speakers. Always great to chat with you. Everyone have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks everyone. Thanks. Thanks.